one of the things that kind of manifested itself from that was the two of the teams were really, really lacking. And in my recommendation, I recommended that they go back for some remedial training. It was at that point he called me into his office and said, I'd like to offer you a job. So it was a unique situation that I don't know that any police departments that were hiring young civilian males to right. basically take their canine program and run with it. And fast forward 30 years, I'm still doing it. And I've wow. you know, picked up some other agencies. We've uh, had several changes of police chiefs and we've just become a very integral part of our community and that police department and now our local sheriff's office as well and just never look back. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Big Dog Podcast background. But I got a good friend of mine, the best beard in the dog business, <laughs> is with us this morning. Howard Young with White Beard Canine. Howard, how are you, buddy? I'm very well. How about you? Man, I'm just excited to have you on here. You know, I guess we met at my facility a couple of years ago at a Steve Stoop seminar. Yes, indeed. Yes. That he did. You guys, you and your wife were up from North Carolina, right? Yes, we were. Yes. Uh, we have known, we have known Steve a pretty long time. And when he went off to do his army thing. He uh, really was, we, we really lost touch. So it was a unique opportunity to kind of get together and yeah. and see him again. Yeah, that what a that was a wild time. That was a fun, fun couple it of was. days. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was cool. We met so many great people and, and you, know, you and your wife were a part of that. And we've been talking about ever since, like doing a show together. And, yes. you know, life just does its thing and runs. You, you retired now since then, right? Because you weren't retired. Free- at the seminar. Right. So uh, really I've had several things going on for the past 30 some years, but the dog business has always been kind of a secondary thing. Yeah. So I was a mental health professional for about 22 years. And then I was in public education for a number of years. And that's what I ended up retiring from. And the whole purpose of that was to be able to do more dog related things before I get too old and decrepit to be able to do it anymore. <laughs> So, so how did you get into the the dog world? Let's let's talk about that a little bit. Well, it's real. It's a unique situation in that when I got out of college, the first thing I wanted to do was get a dog. I was really interested in working dogs, and Rottweilers were my breed of choice at the time. And, and yeah. That's that was my I had German Shepherds growing up, but I really wanted a Rottweiler. And at that time in the early 80s, they were they weren't very well known, Mm -hmm. at least in this country. So it wasn't that difficult to find some good working dogs still. And uh, I got involved with uh, uh, Schutz. It actually wasn't Schutzen Club yet. It was with a gentleman that trained some police dogs. And it was one of those perfect storm situations being there the right time. He had a decoy that had just left and I was young and fit enough to to do it and <laughs> eager to learn. So I started learning how to do that. And he also trained a number of protection dogs, but he introduced me to the sport of Schutzen and we started a club. And uh, not to make a sh- super long story out of this, I started having some of the local police officers saw some of the work I was doing and they started coming by with uh, problems, um, mainly engagement issues and dogs that just didn't bite well and they didn't yeah. have uh, great control. So they started coming to some of them on the sly, which was not real cool, I guess. But uh, what ended up happening is that the local new pol- police chief wanted uh, me to evaluate the four teams they had. And I put together some scenarios that I felt like were fair. And one of the things that kind of manifested itself from that was the two of the teams were really, really lacking. And in my recommendation, I recommended that they go back for some remedial training. It was at that point he called me into his office office and said, uh, I'd like to offer you a job. So it was a unique situation that I don't know that any police departments that were hiring young civilian males to right. basically take their canine program and run with it. And fast forward 30 years, I'm still doing it. And I've wow. you know, picked up some other agencies. We've uh, had several changes of police chiefs and uh, we've just become a very integral part of our community and that police department and now our local sheriff's office as well. And just never look back. Yeah, that's incredible. And so, so talk to me about what is the, I mean, obviously you were talking about kind of like your, your professional, you know, course, you know, through your yes. life, the things you were doing and, and the, the 
common denominator between all of those are selflessness and service, you know, areas mm-hmm. of service and kind of having, you know, to, to excel in those fields. And particularly with what you're doing now with the dogs and work with the departments, there is this, this servant's heart aspect. Mm-hmm. you know, if you will. And so kind of talk about how as you're as you're coming up, you know, through your life professionally, the dog thing was never the primary thing. It was like the secondary thing. But how did those passions, were they over to overlap? And when did you know the dogs, you needed to get yourself in a position to go primarily with the dogs? Well, I, I think one of the ways that I've been able to stay so I never experienced burnout. And I think some of that was because that has always been kind of a secondary thing that I've done. But I I would say in terms of this, I learned a lot in uh, my job as a mental health professional. I worked in a rehabilitation program for folks with severe persistent mental illnesses. So illnesses like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and major depression. We uh, operated a program that, that followed a model that was kind of unique in and of itself. It was uh, out of New York City, a place called Fountain House. And you know, when, when you think about traditional mental health, you think about providing a service to help people get better. But the reality is we're, we're dealing with illnesses that many people don't really ever recover from. Yeah. They're 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 lifelong illnesses and you go to mental health for treatment and treatment is a is a vital part of what needs to happen but really where the where the tire hits the hits the road is is the rehabilitation part and that's where we came in is is that we had a program that by design the lines were kind of blurred between the the staff members and actually we refer to it as a club so it was a voluntary program and we at one point in our small community had upwards of 70 people coming a day Wow, and it it was a model for the state. So we did a tremendous amount of training our, ourselves. But what was unique about it is is that it focused on people's talents and skills rather than deficits, and that was really the the major difference. Is that we weren't interested in what was wrong with you. We wanted to find out what skills you had and put it to use. So yeah. as you would come to this program, you would see people that were uh, actively involved in the running of it. So we had a snack bar. We had a kitchen that provided lunch every day. Uh, we had a, a clerical unit that put out a newsletter and, and assisted with billing. And it was just a uh, phenomenally run place. And uh, I think it's funny is that, you know, when your tri- typical mental health professional thinks about a voluntary program, they would think that, that people wouldn't come or they wouldn't do anything. But here right. on, a, on a rainy, let's say a rainy Monday morning, and you've got 70 people that showed up that had a choice of rolling over and going back to sleep and just drawing their disability check. Right. right. So, you know, there were some powerful things that were going on there. And it was just a, it really, it was a place that taught me the, I guess, the value of people, regardless of their station in life or regardless what's going on in their lives and to treat, you know, everyone with dignity and respect. And I think that's, that's carried over probably the most in terms of, you know, just dealing with people in general. Right. You know, it's funny. It's, you know, the, th- the thing you said about focusing on their strengths, interests, passions, rather than letting the focus be on their deficits, when a lot of folks in those situations, whether it's something that's a season of life or it is a, a lifelong illness mm-hmm. challenge that, that they're going to have, most people don't approach them or treat them from that aspect the no, focus is solely on the deficit mm-hmm. and it's either you know brushing people aside um dismissing them definitely not treated with respect a lot of times you see it and the thing that's not haha funny but funny is the correlation between people and dogs in that regard and mm-hmm. you know in in my world in the dog world i'm not on the working dog side i'm all pets mm-hmm but so often all we're hearing from people are the deficit of these dogs. And you got to take right. this dog. You got to fix this. You got to do this and you got to do that. You know, and it's so funny because it's, it. we're not curing cancer here. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, we're, but well, what we are doing though, is we're getting these dogs. We're folks, what do you do? Well, what mm-hmm. do you enjoy? What gets your confidence up? What gets you more engaged with me? And it's mm-hmm. funny how so often the deficit, a lot of these times with these dogs we see isn't something that's cured. It's a managed thing. Right. But it becomes so much more manageable when the dog realizes there's more to them than the deficit. Mm. But if all you're if all we focused on from a handling standpoint was deficit, 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 you're gonna have a broke down, beaten down, mm. paranoid, skittish 
dog mm-hmm. just as you would a person or a kid who was treated that way and now mm-hmm. they're an adult and you wonder why you know they can't be in relationships they can't communicate they can't hold a job they can't you know do anything society would deem worthwhile but they've just been told over and over and over again that they're not worthwhile mm-hmm. <laughs> brutal and we mm-hmm. see that with the dogs all the time all the time so on the working dog side, I know you had that interest. You got those Rotties. I have a Rottie myself. Um, mm. We've got <laughs> Rocky. He's about 140. He looks like a freaking wine oh, barrel. Oh, goodness. But you know, <laughs> he doesn't look like a wine barrel. He's actually just jacked. And mm-hmm. he's, he's an athlete. I trained him when he was a pup, and I fell in love with him. Mm-hmm. And I told the owners when I, I took him back to him at the end of training, look, guys, if life ever happens and you can't keep this dog, I'm your first phone call. And mm-hmm. they were a little older and her mm-hmm. parents are much like in their nineties and they ended up moving in with them and mm-hmm. old Rocky, you know, he was 10 months old when I trained him and he was about three or four when I got the phone call from him and he had just leaned against her mama, not anything great, just, and she went toppling over and her yeah. father was ready to kill the dog. Like actually had a shotgun was going to kill the dog. So she calls me, I'm like, bring him to me. And now my wife has a huge Rottweiler. Um, that is my wife's dog through and through, but we've always had Rotties and grew up with them. They're amazing dogs. I love them. Mm-hmm. Our house looks ridiculous. So we have this, this Rottweiler, the size of a tank. We have a 53 pound little hunting lab, Charlotte. And then we just got this miniature Australian Labradoodle. She's a year. <laughs> and so we look like the weirdest house on the street because we've got from you know terror in rocky to this mm-hmm. little like build a bear thing walking around and here i am big old bearded guy carrying this little doodle puppy but it's the funniest thing she's the dog i never knew i needed mm. and she's just a great great little dog um but i i try to imagine like man you are really convenient you don't shed you don't like <laughs> barrel through the house like a bull in a china shop and rocky's a very good dog but he's a grown man it's like another grown man living in the house mm-hmm and you know Roddy's and their personalities, and you got to earn it every day with them. Um, but I was like, man, I really can't imagine a time in my life where I wouldn't want to not have Roddy's. Yeah. I just, I love them. I love them. They're wonderful dogs, uh, incredible dogs. Um, what What's your crew look like now? What are you, you still running some Roddy's or? No, no, haven't had a Rottweiler in a good long while. We do have a Dutch Shepherd that is that is really quite a handful. Um, typical Dutch Shepherd. He was very slow to mature, but he's a he's a force. <laughs> what are you finding? Um, so I know you work with several different agencies. You're working with that <laughs> local department still that you've worked with for for years. What are some of the biggest changes you've kind of seen in the industry over the last you know 10 15 20 years you know whether it's education whether it's dogs whether it's ongoing training um because i think that's an important thing that people don't really realize they see this is most people's understanding of a, a canine in law enforcement they see the car drive by they see canine sticker on it and they're like "Ooh, they got one of those cool dogs this dog's <laughs> those things. and i've seen horror stories of dogs that were ill prepared that weren't trained well they didn't have the background or my favorite is i get the phone call hey i got a german shepherd i i need i need it to be a, a protection dog hey i got myself one of these uh belgian malanoises and um i want you to train it to to protect my family i'm like hold on you're so off base right now well it's a german shepherd what do you mean it can't do it i'm like well there's a lot of things that go into this and well i'm just going to donate it to the police department if he won't stop peeing in the house and i'm like hold on can you (laughs) like how people think about this and i don't necessarily think they realize the importance of the training and relevant training that goes into the dogs. So can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. You know, I I like to think that what we try to procure for the agencies are really the professional athletes of the dog world. And and in that, we're looking for dogs that are obviously environmentally sound. And and more specifically, what I mean by that is that regardless of where they are, where they go, they kind of either are neutral to the environment or they're confident Right. The way they carry themselves, so they have to be explo- exposed to slick floors, uh, all varieties of stairs, possibly an elevator, loud noises, uh, and we really don't get too too terribly concerned if there's a little bit of a reaction. It's just how quick do they recover from that reaction, right? So, 
in, in some in some cases, you know, we're, we're getting dogs. Well, we are getting most of our dogs from Europe. In fact, almost all of them. And we don't really know how they've been raised. You can kind of surmise right. the longer you have it, you can tell if it's been raised in a home or if it's been raised in a in a setting where the only thing it's really ever seen is a you know green grass in a in a field. Sure. So, so those dogs, you, it's nice to have that information up front because they may encounter their first vacuum cleaner on wheels. Right. And that's the freakiest thing they've ever seen in their lives. Yeah. And they might have a reaction to that, but day two, they might go, ah, no big deal. I've seen right. that before. So those are kind of things that we have to consider. And what we, what we bank on is that those things have been sorted out before we ever lay eyes on the candidates. Yeah. So. I've used a number of vendors here in the States over the years, but the last probably five or six years, I've been relying on a gentleman in, in Europe and I've bought them uh, primarily just through video, but more importantly is a year and a half relationship of talking about what I need. Yep. Uh, and, and a little measure, well, a, a big measure of trust and that uh, he's not going to, send me a dog that I can't use. And so far he's really, he's been like six for seven oh, wow. in terms yeah. of dogs. And to me, that's vitally important. And, and to have that relationship at this point, this, this would be somebody, if he came to the States, I, yeah, I'd welcome in my home, you know, he yeah. could stay here, but you, there are plenty of people out there that, that want to take advantage or, and there are people that are eager to, you know, e easily taken advantage of. Right. Uh, so during that year and a half, I wanted him to know many things. I wanted him to know who I was and it would not behoove him to send me anything that wouldn't be good. Right. Because the word's going to get out. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So now you're helping agencies with placement. You're helping agencies with ongoing training. Um Talk to us a little bit about what, what that looks like. Like how often are you going in and maybe like certifying or recertifying or helping teams get, you know, maybe something happened. You need to help get them back in the, in the game a little bit. So the, the primarily, my primary position really is two contracts with the, the local agencies. And the way I like to look at that is that I, I don't know that I really want to be in the business of just procuring dogs for, mm -hmm. for different agencies. I want to have hands on from them from the very beginning and then throughout yeah. the, the career. So in our contracts, we basically uh, provide the training. We procure the dog, we provide the training and it's, the training once we start never ends. So an example is tonight, I'll, I'll have a group of uh, gentlemen and we meet uh, one agency I meet with twice a week, the other one once a week. Okay. So it's, uh, we get at least 16 hours of, of training in a month, that's typically great. more. And I think that's really been the, the secret sauce in some respects, because a lot of training groups are set up so that they, they meet once or twice a month. I prefer to have the, the weekly contact, if not twice a week contact. And it's, uh, even though it's not a full eight hour day, I think we probably accomplish more in four hours than a lot of people do in an eight hour day. Sure. If you start factoring in breaks and lunch and, yeah. and errands. and Yeah. That's, um, it's so interesting to me you know, within that world there, because, you know, you think about when these dogs are going to work and you're talking about like the pro athlete of the dog world mm -hmm. who you're, you're looking for, you know, you need that elite animal who not only physically is sound, but mentally, emotionally, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, you don't mind it, you know, getting caught off guard a little bit, but how quickly does it mm -hmm. respond? Get mm -hmm. back into the fight, uh, whatever it is, you know, how quickly can it recover? And the importance of that, you know, if, if a dog is released to engage and that dog hesitates or that dog, you know, freaks out because it goes mm -hmm. into a building and it's a dark room or a dark corridor and it hasn't seen these things before. Right. You know, it's these dogs, it, it's almost ill-prepared are a liability oh for sure to, to the officers on site you know to to everybody and and you know the the preparation and the work that you're doing weekly you know is what's make sure that hey you can't you can't anticipate everything mm -hmm. possible but it's almost mm -hmm. not necessary once that right. dog is sound you know mm -hmm. the dog's like okay yeah I, I've, I've i've been around something like that before or right. you know this this smell, this surface, this feeling, this, I'm getting hit, I'm getting thrown, I'm getting shoved, mm -hmm. I'm getting not a, a good 
bite or you know even in the in the bite work side that was one of the things with steve that was so <laughs> interesting to me during that seminar was like he wasn't using the suit right <laughs> like right and i was i'm just sitting there and, I, and logan you know i remember him saying too he's like holy crap he's just like offering his his shirt mm -hmm. You yeah. know, and here's this dog going buck wild, ready to roll. And he goes, well, hey, look, your bad guy's not going to be running around in a, you know, full suit. Mm -hmm. And now in training, but then there's different variations of the suits and all this stuff. But the real life practical situations that you can get those dogs into mm -hmm. is just so vital for the safety and protection of everyone. The dog, the handler, the other teams on site um, sure. and the bad guy you know that, that they're getting after you want that dog to respond you know appropriately what um what do you find you know with the dogs that you're looking for what are those ages you know that they come in or agency already has a dog what are the where where are those dogs at how often are the dogs usually in service before they retire them out um you know what's that look like so you were wanting to know what some of the differences are over the last 20 years. That's probably a primary difference. Uh, the age is much younger. Okay. We, we used to get dogs that were two and sometimes three and really three years of age was kind of used to be my cutoff. Um, now, if a dog has been sitting in Europe for two or three years there, you got to be asking the question, what's wrong with it? Right. They okay. wouldn't. So we're, we're getting dogs at a much younger age. Um, we've had a couple that we've brought in at 10 months which that's young. Yeah. But th the thing is my process could take upwards of six months. So sure. I don't mind taking a younger dog and, and take my time slow and develop it slowly and allow it to mature. Uh, you know, we bank on a good bit of generalization, which is what you were talking about in terms of preparing the dog. And that, that is a good portion of what we do is we try to, and you've probably heard this said before is that we look at it like, we want to give the dogs certain pictures for their portfolio. Right. And yeah. in that, in that portfolio, they're going to have certain things that they've seen before that it's going to, they're going to, it's going to click for them. Yep. That, oh, yeah. I've, I've done this before, but what's interesting though, is that sometimes we have, and it's not, it's not talked about enough. I don't think is that there are failures to engage sometimes early on. And it's typically as a result of not having the appropriate number of pictures. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we see dogs on social media that, that fail and people go, oh, that's terrible, you know, terrible training, terrible dog. Well, nine times out of 10, it's probably not the dog. It is probably confusion. Yep. And, and you you mentioned the suit. Uh, yeah, that's equipment. That's equipment to protect us. Okay. What it, for the dog, what it does is that it he figures out the game. And they, I mean, they're masters of association. They they can spot a suit a mile away. Right, yeah. If they've, yeah. If they've seen one. Yep. So yes, we're we're constantly looking to find ways to make the picture look more realistic. Yeah. And there's all kinds of ways to do that. And you know, S Steve is very entertaining in the way he <laughs> he does that. But his uh, the and shirt the thing. That he, <laughs> yeah, the shirt thing I I've done here. It's funny, and I I got it from him, and uh, the reaction is really quite comical because. It's it's not as sketchy as it looks, but right, right. It, it, I mean, you're, you're paying attention. You're a pro. You know where you're at. Steve knows where he's at. He's putting a lot of trust does. in the person on the other side of that sure. line, though. Well, that's usually the comment that I get is that they don't trust anybody well enough to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's not the dog we're worried about. You know, <laughs> I know what the dog's gonna do. Exactly, <laughs> bite me. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. So, you know, what's the next five, ten years look like? you know, for, for you and kind of the, the agencies you work with there locally down in North Carolina, like what are, what are those priorities with those teams and that you're really trying to help them accomplish or levels that they get to, you know, are you doing, you know, are you doing tracking trailing at all with these teams? Yes. You're, yes so you're, you're across the board. Yes. They do detection. They do tracking, building search. And the big thing is that there's always been a tremendous, I'd say tremendous, it's always been turnover. It's kind of, it's kind of expected, especially in a relatively small agency. So yeah. one of the things that can possibly happen is that if a gentleman and their lady is career minded and they, they get into K9, even if that's what they've always wanted to do at some point down the road, whether it's three years, five years, or sometimes even less, they're going to feel tugged to get experience in other aspects of the agency. Right, right. So what, what that forces us to have to do is to find another suitable handler and then 
start the process again. So one of the things you were asking about length of service too, in terms of dogs, we've got a 10 year old Dutch shepherd. He's going to be 10 in May and he's not showing any signs of slowing down. Yeah. Yeah. The way I look at it, he's trained five handlers in his career. That's crazy. That's, yeah. that's an, you know, an unusual number, but it's not unusual to have at least two or three handlers per dog. And if we'd like to look career. at maybe a, dog making it to at least his eighth birthday yeah. um depends on the breed you know the back in the day the bigger older shepherds didn't didn't hold up as well some of these hard charging malinois and duchies just don't seem to ever slow down so right yeah you know and, and like with this dog it's hard to know we don't want to we don't want to run him into the ground but the reality is is he's not like a human he's not sitting around counting the days till he retires right he live day to day he just wants to he he's loving the game. He is. And if yeah. he's loving the game and wants to work and physically he's able, I mean, I'm with you. I mean, let, mm -hmm. let him do his deal. Yeah. Because yeah, there isn't that clock in their mind. Nope. That's a completely human construct. A hundred percent. hundred percent. I mean, hell, from the dog's aspect, the dog's probably thinking, hey, if I slow down, that's it. <laughs> Right. Yep. Like I can't slow down. I got to keep going. I got to keep mm -hmm. it. It's actually funny. We were last night. We always have Sunday supper at my house. My mom, my grandmother come over, you know, my kids are there and it's open. Anybody who wants to come over, can come over. But typically it's just, you know, the six or seven of us. And my grandmother was talking about a friend of hers uh, who's just been in and out of the hospital the last couple of years or last couple of months. And she's getting pretty nervous because she's like, ah, oh, I just yeah. have a good feeling about this, you know, and she's in her eighties and um because this is why you can't stop moving got to keep moving you got to keep you know my grandmother she you know she goes to exercise like twice a week and wow you know does her little dances at the house and you know all and she's always running and gunning and doing something but she goes yeah she goes you got you stop moving everything's gonna stop working you know and well, i think there's a lot of truth to that you know and that she was talking about her friend she was like yeah she has a lot of health issues and smoke for seven 60 years mm. and you know all this other stuff and whatever which is eventually it catches up to you and mm. she goes yep and that's why she goes i don't even take tylenol never had to have a surgery never had to, <laughs> she's 86 years old and she's never had a surgery never broken a bone and she's wild like she is a wide ass open lady she's the best but she she's like just gotta keep moving it's got to keep moving. And I'm like, dang, you were talking about that Dutchie. And I'm like, that's mama. Yeah. But <laughs> well, buddy, you told me emotion is lotion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. That's incredible. So what do you got big going on coming up? Anything on the, the calendar? Any big events or anything like that? Yes, actually several. Uh, going to Georgia, uh, Columbus, Georgia for a decoy seminar in a couple weeks. And then we've got trip to another decoy seminar in Indiana. Then we've got Hold the Line Conference in Myrtle Beach. Going back to Connecticut to work with the Connecticut State Police on another decoy seminar. Cool. And then uh, going out to Colorado for a seminar and then i've got another one in indiana but yeah it's we're busy i mean it's yeah, good awesome. yeah that's really great and you and the wife travel together on these things well it's time? funny because she just retired too so yep. she retired like, like a, a, a month ago and she initially was saying she was going to go on all these trips she's already backing out Yeah, <laughs> so she's going to be able to pick and choose what she wants to go so i take a gentleman with me on most of these decoy uh, workshops that's uh uh, Mike Santana, who's a trainer down in Georgia, he was just young guy who's just, I think he's phenomenal. He's, we're, we're very like-minded in that we're both relatively quiet and don't like to be, you know, standing at the forefront. So it's nice to have a, an additional person there. We kind of bounce off of each other. Sure. And I feel like I'm, uh, I don't really feel like I'm bringing him into the fold, but I do feel like he, he's a talent that should be recognized and that's cool utilized that's great and you got a podcast also i do it's so called the working dog that. depot working it's the dog working dog depot. depot i don't know what your venture was like but when we started we were we floundered we uh <laughs> we did six episodes that we recorded on skype and we didn't have a clue what we were doing we didn't feel like we had any good resources and then finally we got we just it just died and then we we made a second attempt and we actually got it going. But what it took was really reaching out to some people and just asking questions, you know, specific yeah. questions and, and realizing that we were going to have to pay for some services. Yeah. Because 
I tried editing an episode and it, it was okay, but I felt like <laughs> the learning curve was like, by the time I learn how to do this and right. I try to do it the next time I'm starting all over. Job. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to do that. Uh, so we are into our second year. We've got, we're, we're actually, we have a recording with the gentleman in Belgium, uh, part two tonight or this afternoon because six hour difference. Sure. And, uh, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. We've picked up some sponsors that some really good folks and well-named folks, which is neat. That's cool. But it's really geared, I guess, more toward, uh, I think canine handlers have gravitated toward it the most. Yeah. And in a, from the content aspect, you can kind of see why they're, they're, they're looking for answers and they're looking for, for more information. And uh, both Rich and I are kind of low key. We're not going to stand up and beat our chests. We, right. we want to hear what our, you know, our guests have to say, because we, we certainly don't know everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. No, I love it. And I can totally relate when we, I, I mean, I talked about it for years before I finally started it. And my thing was, I was so hung up on everything needed to sound right, look mm. right. Like the, I wanted the studio to look a certain way. I mean, I was, all the stuff I cared about really didn't matter. Mm. Right. The most important thing is just starting and <laughs> doing it. And, but I was hung up on certain things. And so we did that. And now half time, I'm not even in the studio. I, I'm in my mm. office. Like I am now I've seen your doing it from our place over there. And oh yeah, yeah, you mm -hmm. saw the the, the mm -hmm. setup and, and we're getting ready to change that up because we're gonna start letting people use our studio space. Mm. And so we're moving it into a larger space to where there'll be my setup studio designed how I want it to be, and anybody can use it, but then there's gonna be a totally different vibe on the other side of the room that someone could use and shoot. And mm -hmm. we have all the cameras and lights and all that stuff. But half the time I'm just in my office, you know, mm -hmm. like this doing it. And it's it's just doing it. And it's it's good conversations. And the ones I thought were gonna be bangers and just everybody's gonna love and all that. <laughs> my gosh, it, it you know, my mom and grandma listen to it, right? right? And then the one I think is gonna kind of, you know, might be okay, but there were some little tidbits. I'll get the greatest feedback mm -hmm. from people, and I was like, man, that's really cool. And the, the mm -hmm. thing with the, the show that I've always said, I was like, man, if, if, if out of the episode, I'm able to introduce somebody to someone or someone is able to take one thing out of it, one thing out of it that, that helps them. One person gets one thing. That's totally mm -hmm. worth it to me. It's mm -hmm. totally worth it to me. It's worth the time. If I can introduce, you know, you Howard Young to, to, to my network and my listeners, and they can get dialed in with your show and learn more about you and what you're doing, they're going to get so much value out of listening to you and the interviews you have and and stuff like that's so worth it to me and i just think that you know my show for the last two years has not been dog driven at all mm. we we don't talk dogs a whole lot we talk business we talk life mm -hmm. we talk family um you know and and a lot of it's business driven and entrepreneurial driven mm -hmm. Um, but it, it was never going to be about the dog stuff, but of late, I'm like, man, a lot of the dog community really gets on my nerves. It's so, <laughs> it's so split. Mm -hmm. It's so split. And I really want people to realize the resources we have in each other. And, and it's always just opportunities to learn. Mm -hmm. And when you stop learning, I think it's the same thing. You stop moving, you know, the motion is lotion. You're talking about same mm -hmm. thing with the learning. Like you, you just, you die, whether it's this business or anything else. Mm -hmm. If you think you know it all, you're done. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, I felt this need to present as if I knew it all. Mm -hmm. Now I'm like, guys, I'm an idiot. I'm, I'm dumb as hell. Like, I don't know anything. And it's funny that now I try to tell the world about that on different platforms, but it's an opportunity to learn mm -hmm. and hear stories mm -hmm. and grow and that's, I don't know, that's just what it's about for me. So I don't care if I got 10 listeners or, you know, a million listeners. If someone can walk away with something, I feel good about it. Right. I feel like I'm terrible at predicting how successful an episode is going to be. It is impossible. If there's, there's one that touches my heart and I think it's going to be a good one and it just doesn't have an effect on anybody. Yeah, you're like, no, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> Look, but you got to show up and you got to do it again. Yeah. And in the beginning, when those numbers are really humbling, mm. you know, it's so easy to say, all right, you know, we'll, we don't need to prioritize this. 
Right. And, you know, if you're at how many episodes now? Uh, we're di- today will be 36. Okay, dude, you're probably like, honestly, probably like top 20% of podcasts of all time. Like most podcasts don't get past like seven or eight episodes. Wow. They never do. It, it's some crazy stat. And um, it, it so really, really good on you. I mean, that's hard. 30 mm-hmm. some odd episodes of content or guests that you're interviewing. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's really, really hard. So really, I'm, I'm really proud of you. I mean, because that's that's a oh, tough you. thing to do. Everybody says they want to do it, but it's well, it was funny you. when Rich contacted me, my co-host uh, before. Well, he said, called me one day, just kind of out of the blue. We didn't talk a lot. He said, hey, I'm thinking about starting a podcast. And I said, wow, that's great. Let me know how it turns out. (laughs) He said, no, I want you to do it with me. (laughs) I said, okay. (laughs) We had no idea what we were going to do. But but he really, you know, it was really his design to have just good conversation. Yeah. And and that's the vibe we've tried to project. I think, you know, so far we've pulled it off. Uh, We've not had any guests that I feel like were you know nasty or terrible i think that everyone is uh there i will say there's probably some folks that i that i would just rather not interview but i could agree I think with that. that's fair yeah yeah that's super fair and it's your show so you don't have to sure <laughs> you can sure. do whatever the hell you want to but i you know i'm not opposed to having somebody that might be viewed as a little i don't know offbeat yeah sure my thing is and, like I don't got to agree with everything. Sure. Right? Like are you but yeah. are you like a good human being, right? Can we have a mm-hmm. conversation? If you're just a mm-hmm. dirtbag human being, like mm-hmm. I'm not interested in really having a conversation. You know, maybe that's just me. Cuz with you it's easy. I'm like Howard, I got to have on this thing. Oh, because you're just good good people. You know, your wife are good people and you know, you're doing great stuff in the in the community not just your community, but like in the dog world itself. And you're super well respected and you, you are absolutely, you said, you're like, I'm kind of, you know, I'm quiet, you know, not trying to be in the forefront, but you have the wisdom to be in the forefront and you have that to share and give. So I love the podcast. I love the seminars that you're attending and doing, you know, I think it's a a really big deal. Um, And it's really great. And I love that it's, a passion that you had for so long Mm -hmm. and it's still there. The desire Mm -hmm. is still there. And that's when you know, it's life. Right. And Mm -hmm. that's so cool to me to, to see and, and, um, and promote. Well, you know, the other thing you're talking about things that have changed, I think the, the internet has certainly impacted this industry greatly. You know, I, I can't, I'm sure it has the pet world, but it certainly has, uh, what I do as well. And, and, you know, there it's, I've always tried to stay out of the drama yes. and I think I've, for the most part, I've managed that. I think I've, if I I'd like a nickel for about every post that I've ever typed up and then deleted because I actually thought it through because it's just not worth it. <laughs> you yeah, know, we have this thing about, uh, <laughs> yeah, we talk about, um, you know, we liken it to a, a tug of rope, you know, just don't pick up the rope. Can't play. Right. Just, just don't pick it up. Easier said than done. A lot of times. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> for hey, sure. You know, the, the typing of it and deleting, that's good. I can think of a lot of times I wish I had deleted instead of hit send <laughs> emails, text messages, social media. Oh my gosh. Um, that's funny. That's funny. So how can people connect with you? How can, what's a, what's a good way for them to, to connect with you, Howard, and, you know, follow you, learn more about what you're doing. Uh, Facebook is a great place. I, I do do a good bit of posting. Uh, cool. It is, it's Howard Young. And I also have another page, white beard canine. The uh, Instagram is Howard underscore WB, WB canine. Uh, we don't have a website yet, but it is on my wife's list since nice. she is now retired. So <laughs> one of the th- re- reasons why I've kind of been reluctant to do that is that we're, we're plenty busy. I mean, I, yeah. Yeah. And I thought that maybe a website make, th- make things a little bit busier, but maybe not. 
Well, yeah, you never know. And what a blessing. Like, I mean, that's the fact that you're plenty busy. You know, you're working with the people you want to work with. You know, the dogs that you want to work with. Um, it's good to have those options. You know, it's good sure. to have those options and, and figure out how you and what ways you want to contribute and how and stay with that. I mean, you've earned that right. That's for sure. And Logan, well done with those um, those pop ups, yeah, man. Like that was so spot on. So man. well timed. I'm like, geez, man, he got yep. he got it set up. <laughs> it was pretty slick. Well, look, Howard, I appreciate you, man. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on you know, for the, for the show, I hope personally to see you soon, you know, you're just down yes. the road in North Carolina. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll run into each other. Um, I'd love to catch up with you guys. If you're ever coming through, you know, mm -hmm. just hit me up and we'll grab lunch or something on your middle That'd of your travel. Great. But um, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. And I just wish you and your wife the very best of health and wealth and life and impact. Um, I just think it's wonderful. You know, everything you guys are doing, um, and I knew that you were good people the, the moment I met you all at my place. So, oh. you know, I appreciate you a lot, brother. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Y'all follow my guy, Howard. Um, hit him up if you got questions about the working dog world. Um, share the show. Um, let us know, you know, how you feel about it. If you learned anything, drop some questions for Howard and we'll send them over. You got his stuff on there and you can email them to me and I'll forward them out to him as well. So we'll catch you next time on the big dog podcast.